the purpose uh, on uh, on Cuba, opportunities and lessons that we can bring home. And I think this is all very uh, timely. That's a I'm getting a little background noise. Yeah, I'm going to mute everybody else. Okay. Um, I'll describe the bird ecotourism and vital bird conservation scene on the island with details on the fascinating birds. Most importantly, some of our hardworking counterparts working and living on the island and making a difference for both, both the people uh, on the island and the birds on the island. My color code around these photos, uh, if uh, you see a frame that's black, that's my photo. If you see a, a frame that's black and poor, that's my photo, I'm not a photographer, really. It's mine. If you see a, a frame that's red, it's somebody else's. And uh, if it's green, it may be mine, it may be somebody else's, but it gives us a lesson about engagement with our colleagues. And these are some of our colleagues. Um, right here, this is Michael uh, Canisares, our regular leader and former president of the Zoological Society of Cuba. On the left, next is Rosendo Martinez. He's the former head of visitor engagement of the National Park System of Cuba, now retired. Uh, in the white hat is our essential bus driver and go-to guy, Ronel. And last but not least on the right is Adrian Colas. He's uh, one of our local colleagues and friends at the Playa Larga Bay of Pigs area, a bird or a guide. He is a fabulous, um, casa Particular, it's a uh, Airbnb or Casa Renta. Uh, it's a homestay at Playa Larga. You'll get a piece of that. Here's uh, some of our people right before COVID hit us. This was early 2020. This is uh, Adrian's backyard. We're all watching. It's his makeshift sanctuary. Is my uh, good friend um, Larry Balch here, former president of the American Birding Association. Uh, and uh, uh, Soli uh, Paliuka here, looking up at some birds that we're watching. And by the way, we're watching a bee hummingbird, among other birds, uh, in Adrian's backyard. Bee hummingbird, of course, is the smallest bird in the world. So what we'll engage in here tonight quickly is we'll look at three general must-go areas uh, in Cuba, the Las Terrazas Vinales area, the Zapata Swamp, absolute must, and uh, Havana itself and the surrounding environment, environment. Four quick side trips that you can't take on the same, probably can't take on the same visit, but the Guanajuato Vives on the uh, western tip of the island, the north coast, obviously on the north coast, Baracoa on the east tip of the island, and Topes de Coyantes uh, in the middle. And then I'll touch on three or four important engagement issues bird trade, equipment review for our Cuban colleagues, art and culture, and getting there. Well, first Cuba, you all know, it's about 42,000 square miles. It's the size of Virginia or Tennessee, or the uh, Florida Peninsula, if you top off uh, from uh, Texas World and the Panhandle, it's about the same size as Cuba. It has six terrestrial regions, and about 20% curiously enough, uh, happens to be preserved as natural areas, very important. According to the official census, there are about uh, 11 million folks on the island, the birth rate is very low, and Havana uh, has about two and a half or two and a quarter million uh, folks living uh, in Havana, the capital. The ethnic makeup is complicated. A 2014 study found uh, that based on ancestry, um, genetic ancestry in Cuba is about 72% European, 20% African, 8% indigenous, plus one, one and a half percent mixture of Asian, meaning Chinese or Japanese, uh, still on the island. The endemic birds are fascinating. Uh, bird species here on the island are almost 400 species, I believe now, 394, it could be 95, 96 already. 26 endemics, 22 of which are, are national or international conservation concern. This display is artwork done by our colleague Niels Navarro on the island, and it shows uh, the endemics. 
Um, some of my favorite birds are the bee hummingbird number four, Cuban black hawk number eight, Sapata wren number 18, Cuban pony 12, and Cuban trogon 11. Um, we say that there are 26 endemics and there are 28 species seen here. What's the difference? The difference are two that are probably extinct. Uh, that is the Cuban macaw number 15, and perhaps um, maybe the Zapata rail number five. But on our trips, uh, we usually get um, about 22 of the 26 species. And we don't miss much because the ones that we do miss are on either end of the island and, and we don't necessarily go to them on one trip. First visit, Las Terrazas and Vinales. Having landed in Havana, we quickly go to the West Indies area. It includes these wonderful mogotes, East that mountains, limestone cars. Um, another place that you may have seen pictures of these limestone mountains, haystack mogotes, uh, but not in Spanish, of course, is in Southeast Asia. I believe they're in uh, Cambodia or and or Thailand. In any case, we get our first taste of birds. My wonderful picture on the left, if you've got great eyes, you can pick out, pick out a Cuban trogon in there. Uh, I'll let you know, it's right there, central left. That's a Cuban trogon. And on the right is the Cuban pygmy owl. We'll see them probably on the first or second day, most visitors. Um, then we'll also get a good view of the Las Terrasas area of uh, yellow-headed warbler, an endemic, and a regional West Indian woodpecker seen on other islands. In the uh, very interesting. Uh, Species that's in the same genus as our red belly woodpecker. And it really looks like a red belly woodpecker with a black eye. I haven't been punched there. Um, we may stay and see the village of uh, Vinales in the valley there with the bogotes in the background and the mist. We could stay at this uh, hotel, Ermita, on the right and see some of the tobacco barns and vine barns as we, as we go there. But uh, one of the important visits. Um, is to see, excuse me, to see the Cuban solitaire, shown in the lower left. Cuban solitaire looks like you, you, if you take a uh, hermit thrush and throw it in the washer and dryer, that's what it looks like. It's not terribly impressive for a thrush, but its song is absolutely magnificent, an ethereal song. And here we are on the right, there are a dozen of us at the base of one of these uh, haystack mountains in Bogotes. And usually we have one or two of the Cuban solitaires. We were lucky. We don't know why they were there. It sounded like they were competing and singing in territory. We must have had six, eight, ten of them uh, at the same time. It was a, a sight to behold and a great experience. And all the people here are watching them. And there's even a photo of me hunched over there with my scope. We got the, we got the uh, Cuban solitaire. The scope. Um, also in the area uh, is Las Terrazas, which is part of the reforestation project which started in the late 60s. It's a UNESCO biosphere reserve and an eco village of Las Terrazas. And there, there's a terrific Hotel Mocha, one of my favorites. It revolves around nature. Nature is built through it. And uh, you look out the window, you'll see uh, all kinds of uh, endemics and near endemics so you're on the porch or you're at the edge here doing your checklist and indeed uh, there may be a red-legged brush in front of you. But on the right, you see, we also uh, bring equipment uh, for their feeder is one of our participants. And there is one of the feeders we brought. Lo and behold, it's, uh, you can find it at a dollar store. It's a buck a piece, they're a buck a piece and we will bring a bunch of them, you'll see them later. And uh, they're worth their weight in gold in Cuba because they don't have hummingbird feeders. They have two species of, uh, of uh, endemic hummingbirds, but not hummingbird feeders. So when we uh, bring them, you'll see more of them later. Uh, you'll understand the kind of contribution we make. In the Las Terrazas Vinales area, we'll have endemics and near endemics that we see, like the olive cap warbler on the upper left, not unlike the pine associated yellow-throated warbler of our southeastern United States, Cuban uh, vireo, 
We'll have green woodpecker, which is one of my favorite woodpeckers. It has a fizzled down bill. It looks like it's been using its bill too long and it got reduced in size. And we have the regional and wonderful uh, red-legged honeycreeper, a male shown here. Um, we're there, we also have a location there where virtually every trip in the last four years, we've seen Stygian owl in one particular uh, pine grove. Yes, there are pine trees in Cuba. And in this pine grove, we go and search out uh, the Stygian owl. Uh, sometimes in the area, we'll go to uh, one of the uh, hotels with uh, little cabins uh, via Saroa. And uh, there on top of the uh, sign is a welcoming loggerhead kingbird, a little bit like a darker gray kingbird on uh, semi-steroids. And we'll visit the uh, uh, Saroa Orchid, which is really a great, uh, yeah. really a great place to get a, a good feeling for birds. That takes care of the Las Tabasas Vinales area quickly. The main attraction is down here by uh, uh, in this green area. This is a Zapata Swamp. Um, it is uh, the main stage of our activity. It will stay there for multiple days because they're, it's the most uh, interesting area of birds for Cuba. And uh, here's a photo of the entrance. It's a national park, it's a biosphere reserve, it's a Ramsar site, it's a complex, not unlike some of our national forests in the West, where there is sometimes national forest and villages inside the national forest, or for perhaps not unlike Merritt Island here in, uh, in Florida, where there's uh, a national seashore and a uh, national wildlife refuge next to each other. Sometimes you don't know the difference between one or the other. Or where I'm from in uh, Chincoteague, Virginia, uh, near Maryland, where I'm from, uh, there's a national seashore and a national wildlife refuge. And they're mixed in next to each other. That's very much like the Zapata Swamp area, to the point where pe folks don't know where one type of property ends and the other begins. It's also like uh, Cape Cod. We have a national seashore, a state park, a national wildlife refuge in Baltimore. Uh, the center of Zapata Swamp area here is a Playa Larga. We uh, base ourselves here. All the bird tour groups, when I say we, I mean all the bird tour groups base themselves at this upper end of uh, the Bay of Cape, Playa Larga. Um, we go to uh, Playa Giron over here, Bermeja in the, in the interior, Santo Tomas on the other in the western interior, where we go look for um, the uh, Zapata Ren. And um, one of my favorite trips, we take this road down Las Salinas to the end of the road is about 23 kilometers. The town itself, uh, you're welcome with a giant crab over there, um, is can be bustling during good times. This picture was taken before COVID. About, uh, this was taken in 2016, I think it was. And uh, the, the town is full of uh, Lots of European tourists, they don't come for the birds necessarily, they come for the beach. And it's a great place for snorkeling and scuba diving. It's a world renowned. But there are also multiple uh, uh, Airbnbs, homestays, casas particulares, and um, paladares, um, uh, home restaurants uh, like these. Uh, this is one of the places where we stay. Uh, and in the town, um, there will often be, the first floor will be finished uh, in this uh, homestay or Airbnb, and the second floor will be under construction. And uh, before COVID, this, was, as I said, was a pretty bustling place. They've had difficult times since. Uh, one of the places we visit, I introduced to you before, our friend uh, Adrian Comas here holding up one of the feeders that we brought is Adrian and myself, and his Casa Ana, Ana is his wife's name, and uh, it's a um, location of wonderful uh, attraction for all sorts of birders. This is just one of the feeders in his backyard where there are northern parula and a blue warbler, a yellow-faced grassbird. I know bird photographers who sit down there and will stay all day just photographing the birds that come to Adrian and Anna's feeder, uh, including also West Indian woodpecker. Here are uh, two of the uh, endemic 
Participants Alan Reed took this picture this year. Um, these are good pictures. And the, the Zapata Swamp area also is attractive, as I said. To go down, we'll take a, a, a long afternoon trip down to Las Salinas. For me, it's very much like um, Everglades, uh, the, the road down to Everglades, um, Flamingo, um, in, in the Everglades. Uh, although here there are more birding places and there are real flamingos. There are lots of long legged waders and shorebirds and gulls and terns, waterfowl and raptors. A raptor you may be familiar with is right here, of course, snail type. Uh, some of these photos, if not all of them, are from James Hill, who's on our uh, Zoom tonight. Thank you, James. Uh, here are my photos of uh, the other bird we're looking for. Uh, Cuban Blackhawk. Uh, you can see him in my wonderful photo on the left. <clears throat> it's right there. But later on, the Cuban Blackhawk landed closer. You look through all of the snail kites for another gray raptor, which is chubby or bigger, is a budio, and uh, is uh, an endemic of, of the island. There are, um, are some of the little towers I took my picture from uh, one of the towers here. It's about two stories tall. And this is not only our group, but uh, two, two carloads of visiting uh, Cubans, as a matter of fact, who came out on the road to Las Salinas. Um, it's 23 miles to the end of the road. It takes about two, two and a half hours. You turn around, you come back. It's 23 kilometers of wonderful birding. And there are also clapper rails at the end. Uh, one of the few places where we see clapper rails. Also in the Zapata Swamp area, Bermeja is a, the refuge, a little refuge area of Bermeja, which is a specialty zone of uh, uh, some birds. Cuban parrots are seen there, uh, and especially when you go down that trail that we are, that you saw in this photo here, uh, you are going to look for. Uh, Little headed quail doves uh, coming to the crack corn that our colleagues have distributed um, for us. And we're behind a blind, but you see, we're not looking through the blind on the left, we're pointing on the side of the blind. Why is that? And my friend Michael here is pointing to the doves that have finished feeding on that side and are coming around to come to our feet <laughs> to feed uh, the blue headed quail doves to feed on. Um, Corn, which we'll even toss to our feet. It's wonderful. And um, a shire bird, which is invariably among them, but often pushed around by the blue headed quail doves, is the gray fronted dove. I believe this is another photo by our friend James, uh, James Hill. And it's uh, another endemic that we're really interested in seeing. And by the time we leave the Benham area, we see human parakeets. And uh, that takes care of that subset of the Zapata Swamp area. Now here is a lesson in ecotourism and bird conservation simultaneously. This is the little town of ben, uh, Palpite, uh, which is embedded in the Zapata complex. It's another backyard. Here's one of our feeders. There's a group of folks taking pictures uh, in these flowering trees. The owner and his wife, uh, Bernabe and his wife, Anna, are here greeting us. Why? because we brought them lots of feeders. We took two or three of these. This was the whole box we brought with us to Cuba one time. But we're also assembling here in 2018, our leader guide, Ernesto uh, Reyes. And we're putting together this uh, feature here called a humbug. What is the humbug? Uh, it is a feeder, large feeder when you toss in bananas and uh, they grow, I'll put that in air quotes, they grow fruit flies. So not only do the hummingbirds have the, uh, uh, the uh, sweetened water with uh, sugar water that we provide in, in feeders, but they get the more meaty fruit flies that they're able to fly around the uh, humbug feature here. And uh, Bernabe was very happy to get that. Here is a, one of my pictures. I've warned you about this before. 
of a bee hummingbird right in Bernabe's backyard. Here's the humbug uh, up in uh, 2018. And uh, here is a wonderful photo of uh, bee hummingbirds, male and female respectively. But Bernabe, who, who invites birds to come to his backyard, uh, is holding up one of the smaller tube type feeders that we gave him. And he's uh, attracting the bee hummingbird to his very hand. Uh, these are, I believe, my photos, believe it or not. But he had a great uh, experience. He's discovered birds over the last 10 years and is proud to be a host of uh, bee hummingbirds and lots of other creatures. Here I, here I am holding uh, yet another feeder and a bee hummingbird coming to it. This is not my photo on the right, but it gives you a, an idea of proportion, size of the bee hummingbird on a number two American uh, pencil. In uh, Bernabe's backyard, there are also very uh, interesting, often, uh, Cuban Orioles. This is a photo by Francisco Veroniones, Veronisi, I'm sorry. And that gives you an idea of the gang and cluster at uh, Bernabe's uh, backyard in uh, uh, Palpite. Another place, as I said, that we go, by the way, where is Palpite? Palpite is right there. We just visited his feeder there. We're staying in Playa Larga. And one morning we take uh, our bus all the way out on this road, which is pretty good, but it's tough. Takes us a couple of hours to get to Santo Tomas. And when we get to Santo Tomas, it's a little town. At the time it had about 30 residents. Here's the typical Cuban school with a Cuban flag and a bust of Jose Marti. This is the shop of Santo Tomas. This is a wonderful mural done by our friends of the Terminia, the Cuban um, the, uh, Zapata Ren here that you can see. And it's uh, a fascinating location. Uh, next to the schoolhouse, I mean, the, the students were only four, four students, four or five students. There was a teacher, an assistant teacher, and a doctor visiting them. There are doctors everywhere in Cuba. He was visiting for a few days to check out everybody. This was before pandemic. This was, I think, 2017. And here's uh, our friend Michael. Uh, that's the schoolroom. We brought them coloring books, crayons, and the coloring books about birds. Um, a pair of binoculars for the teacher, the whole bit. It was really terrific. But the main course, the main activity is to take out uh, these uh, pole boats that are pulled out, uh, not rowed out, uh, and this old channel that takes us out deeper into the swamp. I think these are two photos by James Hill also. Although mine on the right, James on the left, I believe. And we go out there, there's our friend uh, Michael Canisades looking back at me taking the photo. On the way out, we'll see Zapata Sparrow. Um, to me, it looks like a smaller version of those of you burning out west of Green Toad. Uh, it's in a different genus, but it, it reminds me of that kind of look and feel. Um, and we row out, row out, we pull our way out like uh, like uh, gondolas in Venice. Uh, these guys uh, will bring us out maybe 20 minutes, a half hour to this platform. We'll walk out with them uh, and we'll wait. And uh, in this case, Ernesto or another trip, Michael, will play the tape of a Zapata Wren. And here are my two fabulous photos of Zapata Wren. On the left and right, we'll attract them in. And by the way, you don't over, overdo it there. The visitors who come there maybe, I don't know, once a week, once every two weeks, I'm not sure, in the season, perhaps in the winter, once a week, uh, at the very most. Uh, here's a much better photo by David Beebe of uh, the Zapata Wren. To me, it looks like a brownish and slightly smaller uh, cactus red in terms of its stature. Uh, but it's, it is a rare endemic of Cuba, and we have a good time. At the end, we go back on our, our gondolas, and uh, here's Ernesto, and we're giving out baseball hats to our uh, gondoliers, for want of a better word. Uh, I think this was 2017, and the blue hats there I believe are uh, Chicago Cubs. I mean, one of the ones 
2009. We go back to Playa Larga where there are other tourists and we take a break. We go in, we go into the beach or we take a deep break to one of the um, uh, cenotes, limestone sinks for a little bit of a swim. And that's a lot of fun on the right. Having done those two key areas, the Vinales area over here and the Sepada Swap area here, we go back to Havana and wrap up our trip. Unless we're doing some other, we can add on some other locations, and many of the groups do, one, two, or three other locations. But those are the three core locations, the third being Havana itself. It's a fascinating city with wonderful architecture, old American Chevys, Oldsmobiles, and Buicks, and some interesting housing. And here are some terrific cars. By the way, that's our bus over there. And these are some of the terrific old uh, Chevys, Buicks, uh, Pontiacs, DeSotos, et cetera, um, that are serving as uh, tourist taxis. And we've, we've been on those a few times. A fascinating, well, there's an Oldsmobile on the left, rest on the left. Uh, this is a uh, view from uh, one of the Casas Particulares that my wife and I were at near the capital. There's the Capitolio over there. It looks like our capital that's been on a slim fast diet. It's kind of skinny looking, but uh, there it is over there. What do we do? Well, we're looking for all kinds of birds while we're in the in the capital. Here's the, the Hotel Nacional, the famous Hotel Nacional. We're in the backyard having some drinks. This is Larry Bolch, former president of ABA, our driver, Ronell, some of our participants. We have a mojito or two, and of course there's red-legged thrust at our feet or some Warblers that are um, palm warblers or other that are visiting the backyard and wintering the air uh, the time at the, the hotel that's in Atlanta. It's a great place, but we do make a stop uh, to the uh, university. And this is uh, our daughter Judith in 2006 looking at a guide how to get around town. But these are our two friends, Alieni and Lourdes. They are uh, teachers at the university and we're giving them supplies. Coloring books, uh, crayons, bird bird coloring books, binoculars, sometimes um, uh, small um, cameras uh, for their use, and uh, uh, we leave them a good supply. While we're seeing some of the uh, sites of the city, some fascinating old buildings over here on the left and here on the bottom, some combination of old buildings that are the front and new hotel buildings in the back uh, to take care of European tourists. I mean, yeah. These are some of our digs uh, on the third floor. This is my coworker, uh, Sole Payuca, and uh, some of the views from uh, our Airbnbs. But we're there to see the birds uh, as we see the city. Brown pelicans, Antillian palm swift on the right, uh, Royal Turn, Cuban Martin, and in between, yes, we can, in wintertime, we'll find a peregrine or two on some of the buildings, roosting for the season. What, what's the peregrine doing there? Going after Eurasian collar ducks. Yes, they've arrived in Cuba many years ago. They're particularly in the towns of the city. Uh, to see some of these uh, seabirds or gulls and terns, uh, a walk by the Castillo uh, or the Malecon is. Uh, is required and it's a fun time. But we also will go to outs the outskirts of Havana, one of my favorite places, the National Botanical Gardens of Havana. Um, it's 25 kilometers out of town, 600 hectares, 4,000 plants. And we go there, among other things, to see the Cuban meadowlark. It's a subspecies as of this moment of Eastern meadowlark, but it sings differently and it does it my day. Uh, our friends Niels Navarro and Michael uh, Canitatis think that this is a uh, legitimate species that every observer should put in escrow for their likeness. Uh, but we engage with the uh, instructors that very often the kids, uh, the school kids come to the uh, uh, National Botanical Gardens and we help the, uh, with the instructors there and the staff with some supplies that we, we leave off for them. The uh, location is terrific. Um, there are things like uh, the two flavors of uh, kestrel, American kestrel, the rufous form and the light-breasted form seen here. Sometimes we'll run into uh, 
a guy fixing his old uh, Soviet era motorcycle. He was one of the workers at the Botanical Gardens. We'll visit the Japanese Botanical Gardens on the right, uh, where we'll find uh, Tommy Gallio and look for smooth Bilani at the edges. Visit the Great Lizard Cocoon. So those are the four locations. See, there are other places. One of the on this end of the island, north coast over here, uh, Baracoa on the west. I'm sorry. Uh, Juan Acamibes is on the west side of the island, excuse me. Um, Baracoa is on the east side. Uh, the uh, coastal area is over here. The north coast has some interesting places. And uh, the uh, areas of uh, Topes de Cayantes is very good around here, near Trinidad. First visit, very quickly, Juan I visited there once. You Floridians may take it seriously for a couple of reasons. Not only that it has nice beaches, but it's the end of the island. And there's some interesting um, uh, scuba locations and a central uh, location for visitors. And here's our friend um, uh, Ernesto with banders. These are Cuban banders. It's a banding zone, and uh, they band birds, our quote unquote, our migrants that come across down through Florida, through the Keys, across Cuba to the uh, western end and launching across the island. And they're also counting one of the birds that we've seen uh, arrive back here in uh, Florida, the swallowtail kites. The map shows some of the routes that they've taken down in, in springtime, uh, I'm sorry, in fall, uh, down the, the uh, either end, either side of the island, through the keys, launching themselves across to Cuba to the end by Guanajacarillas and then going to uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. Some will go as far as well as like Tampa, and if they're brave enough, go all the way across. But it's a fascinating experience. It's a hot lot area. In Guanajacarillas, we, we are distributing here readers to my friend um, Osmani Borel. He's the assistant director at the Guanajacarillas National Park and a terrific birder. We're giving him feeders and calendars and coloring books. And here's our group looking at some of the migrant birds in, in November coming through. That takes care of the west end of the island. Now we go to the north coast around here. North coast is very interesting. There are Kaya Coco and other locations here. Um, Lovely resort, but uh, you might as well be in Barbados or Nassau or Aruba. You don't know that you're in Cuba necessarily. Lots of Europeans come for a package trip, come there. It's all inclusive. Uh, they don't get much of a taste of Cuba, but we come there sometimes to see some of the uh, uh, birds that are more of a Bahamian character that come as far south as the North Coast. Uh, these are some of the all-inclusive hotels. Uh, it's important for the Cubans uh, to get hard currency, lots of uh, French, Italian, Canadian, all-inclusive uh, stay there. Uh, go figure. Uh, but we come there for West Indian Whistling Duck, Bahama Mockingbird, which is one of the few places in Cuba where you can see it. Cuban Nutcatcher, which is in different places on the island, but it's a guaranteed location. And once again, uh, a greater lizard cuckoo. On the North Coast, as I said, it's a place that the Cuban government uses and the Cuban tourism industry uses to bring in tourists, uh, all-inclusive, lots of development, road development. This is our friend Raydell, one of our trans tour guides, um, 2016. Uh, this was um, as a road that was just built uh, through a mangrove swamp uh, to accommodate uh, yet another uh, all-inclusive hotel that's going to be built there. By the way, Raydell is, uh, is, his nickname is Ray. His uh, Cuban name is Raydell. Um, he's using a pair of binoculars we gave him. He had a little, tiny little, you know, opera class. So we gave him uh, a new pair of binoculars. He gave his to the bus driver who was thrilled and helped us find some birds. 
Uh, the other thing we did, the uh, Cayo Coco North Coast is very dry without, without uh, fresh water. So one of the features there among the birders, the bird tour guides, is to create um, one, two or more bird baths. And they will take one of these camp showers that we bring them, hang it in the tree and have it drip into a bird bath. Well, it's really a plate or a bowl that they use. And the warblers and the grass wits will come to it and they will feast on it. So this gives you an idea of the North Coast. Another location is Baracoa. This is our friend uh, Sole's favorite city on the far eastern tip of Cuba. Uh, it's uh, the opposite of uh, the Cayo the North Coast area. It's almost neglected. Nobody ever goes there in terms of tourism, although we've seen a couple of European tourists there. It is both, as they say here, beautiful, clean, and healthy. This is the harbor from our hotel. This is the main attraction, the uh, National Park uh, Alejandro Humboldt, uh, a national uh, uh, heritage site. It's the site of uh, one of the last, uh, if not the last, Ivory Bill Woodpeckers of uh, Cuba, 275 square miles. It's large. And we go and visit, and we brought the staff lots of equipment. Is our friend Giovanni here with one of our feeders. Here's yours truly. Uh, holding up um, some stuff, and uh, one of the rangers, El Indio is his nickname, and our friend Noelis, she's a, an expert on uh, Palomita snails, and uh, they're holding up some feeders that uh, uh, we gave them. Here we are walking through the park uh, in uh, uh, fording a stream crossing its significance, and they met us with a, a cart that crossed. Meat birds. One of my photos of Cuban emerald, uh, Cuban parakeet, somebody else's photos, and the Polynesia snails on the right. Really very interesting. It's a great place to find the giant kingbird. It's like your, uh, it's like your great kingbirds on super satellites. Fat, chubby bill, big, big guy, in, in about five or six locations in the island. Uh, and uh, it's a real delight when we find uh, the uh, giant kingbird. Uh, here was our hotel on the left, and one of the librarians holding a hummingbird calendar we gave. And some of the reality of Baracoa, the hurricanes often will hit the eastern end of the island, Baracoa, and damage it seriously. And this is a, they don't necessarily have the wherewithal to recover quickly. In Baracoa, in Olguin, uh, another town, we discuss with our counterparts there the problem of the bird trade. This is Carlos Pena, uh, one of the uh, ornithologists on the island, his sister, uh, Lourdes Pena. And here she is with one of the student posters, and Lourdes is the director of the Holguin Historical Museum. And our friends uh, Ernesto here, and this is Sobe. Um, and this, this poster is to discourage to teach kids that they shouldn't be necessarily hunting birds or, goodness gracious, um, putting them in cages. And the bird trade has been a real problem in that end of that, particularly Colgene. So we'll revisit this, especially the bird trade. But one of the last places we'll look at is Topes de Coyantes. It is the Escambre Mountains here, another terrific place for birds. It's a nature reserve park. Scambray Mountains. It's beautiful. It was the site of the 2017 um, Birds Caribbean uh, and, uh, Biennial Meeting. Here's my wife Yvonne in the back of a Soviet-style old army truck that gets us up and down the hills. This is the old, um, this is the location where the Bird Conservation uh, Birds Caribbean Meeting occurred. An old hotel built in the 50s that now is a sanitarium um, after the revolution for people having tuberculosis and other things. The Topes de Gallantes area has lovely mountains, steep climbing. Here's our group on one of the uh, one of the hikes that we took. A great place for Cuban toady, a great place with Cuban grass split. But Cuban grass split is a problem, which I'll visit shortly. But it was a great place for us. This is just the stuff that my wife and I brought in our bags. 
to that bird's Caribbean meeting. Uh, three pairs of binoculars, feeders, a camera, Ken Kaufman's book in Spanish, you can see it here, we'll revisit it. Uh, the a shower, uh, the Coleman shower that's used to um, uh, create and uh, sustain a freshwater bird bath. And this is what we do. And this is what we're gonna, we're gonna leave the locations and touch on these four issues before we wrap up. The bird trade issue, which I touched on, the equipment review for Cubans, art and children and getting there. Here's Sole, here's one of our colleagues from uh, Guaya Jacarillas who uh, drove halfway across the island to get all these supplies that we were giving them. Uh, feeders, binoculars, telescopes. Um, we, we, uh, we gave them solar, solar powered lanterns, all kinds of neat stuff. But one of the problems is the bird trade issue, which I touched on a few minutes ago. Um, these are pictures from Baracoa. These are a photo I took of guys going down the street in either pre-made or handmade on the left cages uh, selling birds. In Holguin, one of my photos of um, Cuban bullfinch. Um, during this time around 2016, when there are lots of tourists, the uh, the the acquiescence, the, the uh, possession of birds was a symbol, was seen as a symbol of upward mobility among the Cubans, of a middle class status in their casas particulares, in their little home restaurants and stuff. And we find this kind of thing. And it's also illegal in the country, but you know, it's like jaywalking in the United States is illegal, but it isn't necessarily forced. Here's some picture on the left of Playa Larga, a Cuban bullfinch. On the right, in Santiago, they grew a um, yellow-faced grass quick, a bird that's in real danger. In Santa Clara, a Cuban bullfinch photo uh, that I took. In Santa Clara, again, Cuban bullfinch. Uh, in Havana, a Cuban grass quick on the left, and lo and behold, indigo bunting on the right. Good news in Havana is that they are enforcing, because of pressure uh, our colleagues have been able to uh, do on the, uh, uh, in the Havana government, uh, they are enforcing uh, and on the bird trade and possession of aged birds. Here was a picture of um, one of the uh, our encounters as we pulled off the side of the road just this, this February. Highway number one, Autopista numero uno, Near Vinales, this guy had a bunch of yellow-faced grass quits, and he was selling them. Now, my attitude was, I said, you know, they lost him, how sad. But my friend, Mike, was much smarter. He said, uh, what, what do you, how much do you want for these? And we bought six of these for like $3, and we, then we bought the cage for another $2. Because the guy wants to go hunting again, he's going to have to build another cage. Um, and we released them uh, an hour later down the road. There's an excellent article in the April 2022 issue of National Geographic on the bird trade in Cuba. I recommend this. If that National Geographic get the article and give it a read. It's four pages. Some of our counterparts are mentioned here. Here's an aside on equip, uh, equipment review. Remember the baggage stuff that uh, my wife Yvonne and I brought to Copas de Clientes? When we go to Cuba with a group of a dozen people, we say, put all your stuff in one bag, because we will give you the second bag full of the supplies we're bringing. They may be feeders, they may be books, they may be binoculars, they may be coloring books, they may be crayons, they may be uh, medical stuff. We will give you the second, second bag, and it works very well. And by the time we come home, we only have one bag each to bring back home. Or, yeah. And uh, I bring to your attention this wonderful book. Here's our friend, Niels Navarro. You may remember his picture of all the endemics at the beginning. Uh, anyhow, this is a picture of uh, his book, Endemic Birds of Cuba. Here it is in English and in Spanish. In Spanish, um, for every book that we buy, um, uh, Sole is able to give away a book uh, to Cubans, uh, to teachers, our counterparts. It's a fine book. Here's the pages on Cuban Trogon and West Indian Whistling Duck and Cuban Grass Grid. Here's another great book in English and Spanish, a classic um, 
Birds of Cuba by Arizo and Carcano. It's both in English and in Spanish. It's a little out of date, but it's very helpful. And here's Ken Kaufman's book. You know Ken's book? He did a, he paid himself to uh, have it printed in Spanish. And most of those were distributed in Mexico, which makes a lot of sense. But we brought a bunch of them to Cuba also. They help. Here's his uh, uh, pictures of, uh, in English and in Spanish, parts of a bird. Uh, you know, it's sometimes nice to know that clown is corona and that uh, uh, wingtip is uh, punta de la ala and the throat is garganta. And uh, this way, sometimes uh, when we're talking about the birds with our colleagues, we can actually. Uh, this is the coloring book that the uh, Friendship Association uh, sub subcommittee, the Ediciones Nuevos Mundos, did. Uh, coloring My World, the, uh, the Cuban Parrot. And this is both the front and the back. Uh, it's a coloring book on Cuban parrots. Here is what we did. Uh, also, um, annotated checklist of Cuba is done on a yearly basis by Sole and the uh, Ediciones Nuevos Mundos. Here is our meeting on uh, Autopista Número Uno and Highway Number One. We're going eastbound. Our friends Ernesto and Jody Ellis are going westbound. We called them. We met them on the highway. They were on one side. We were on the other. We got together. Uh, Tony, of course, is from Optics for the Topics. And you see the bag. We gave them extra coloring books to distribute while they, we were ending the trip in Havana. They had just started. So it, here it's a, a cooperative effort. Wrapping up, art in children is important. Here's a T-shirt. Uh, I have a copy of it on my chest right now. It's um, more beautiful, um, more free, uh, protect the birds. And it shows uh, Cuban native birds bursting out of their cages. On the left with the boys and the coloring books. And here are the girls playing with a card game of endemic birds of Cuba. It works. Here are the kids uh, and their teachers, uh, whose teachers made available uh, binoculars and scope. This is a scope. An old ball scope, it's wonderful. You can drive a car over that. It stays there. But this is one I gave many years ago, and I refound it being used by these kids. Uh, here's a particular school that did a mural of the uh, birds, native birds of Cuba, and some other uh, uh, transient um, uh, migrants um, at the edge of their school. And they are, it reads here, I'm looking closely, they are uh, happier, free, and uh, not in cages in your home, I think it's what it says. And this mural was sponsored by our friends at the Cape Cod Bird Club, which they misspelled Cape Cod Bird Club, but they loved it. It was, it was so uh, funny that they didn't insist that they changed it. Uh, here's our friend Ines and some of the artists. Um, Inez is a mover and shaker. Here's birding with a purpose, artwork with a purpose. When Yvonne and I first went to Cuba, uh, people who were artists were painting on not on canvas, but on cardboard boxes. Wrapping up, who might take you to the, the islands, to the island of, of Cuba? So clear and so near, yet so far. It could be on the left, the uh, friends from uh, uh, the uh, Friendship Society, the Caribbean Conservation Trust has also been running for many years to different trips, and Joni Ellis with Optics for the Topics. So those are just three of the folks, three of the outfits that I know who really engage in uh, the situation. Um, here's our bus, our driver, Solbe. You will notice the pin on him. Here's our, the pin on my hat. We give out these, uh, these pins, which have American and Cuban flags on it, to our, our friends, and that kind of wraps it up. Our, our issue of Cuban conservation and birding with a purpose. We looked at three locations, Las Terrazas Vinales, Zapata Swamp, Havana, four side trips, some other engagements on bird trade, equipment review for Cubans, on art and children. I tell you, if, if the, the kids bring home the message that they don't want birds in cages, the parents begin to get it and getting there. Uh, plan a trip to the island, uh, come with one of the organizations I mentioned. Here's one from the Friendship Association. Join the ongoing efforts to help 
protecting the environment by uh, visiting uniquely beautiful places on the island, emphasize on gaining the appreciation of birds, nature, conservation, and work that our counterparts, our Cuban naturalists, are doing to protect and nourish the environment. Cuba engage in light hiking, interact with Cuban nature, Cuban conservationists, help protect the Cuban uh, birds. You may see 110, 120 species, including about 20 of the 27 endemics. You'll have a good time and you'll come home having accomplished something serious. If you want more information, there's my email at the end. This is a picture of us. I think it was 2017 on New Year's Day. Uh, this is uh, Johnny Ellis's group and myself and my wife, Yvonne. We were celebrating New Year's Day. And if you want more information, just email me and I'll be happy to answer your questions, which we're going to start right now. Aren't they, Susan? Aren't they, Deborah? Aren't they? Yeah, that was really great. Yeah, questions. Well, Delcy wants to know what's the next trip. Our next trip is optional. If your if uh, Orange Club wants to have three, four friends get together, uh, we can provide another four or five, and we might go any any time between um, October and this coming October, twenty twenty three, and uh, let's say March April of uh, twenty twenty four. Excluding, of course, Thanksgiving and Christmas and holidays. But um, yeah, um, they're possible. You can also contact uh, Joni Ellis, Optics for the Tropics, and uh, the folks at the uh, Caribbean Trust. Um, and we can, uh, you know, they're, they're all available. And we will, um, at least I can say that Soli and I will make sure that you see as many birds as possible while engaging with our people there. And in, in engendering a feeling of uh, friendship and uh, cooperation. Uh, P.S. The costs are the the costs are um, the uh, friendship association for two weeks. It's about uh, thirty eight hundred bucks. That includes everything, including the flights and the hotels and everything except the booze you want to drink. Uh, but that's that's what it is. Any um, your next questions? And by the way, as you're looking for the next question, many thanks to James Hill. Uh, he was on the trip with us, and and James, you may want to even ask uh, or add two cents when you came and whether this is an accurate uh, description of uh, your experience. You can unmute. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, Annie and I did the trip and uh, yeah. it was um, I th it was just before COVID hit. I think we went in February 2020. And um, I, I think it's really a, a, a worthwhile trip. Uh, I think that uh, the Cubans are, we were very well received by the Cuban population. Um, and I think that um, one thing that's interesting is that the, the I, I think it's now a requirement, but Friendship Association always made an effort to to book the guest houses, the Casa Particulares, because uh, the five star hotels are owned by the Cuban military. So uh, we we uh, I've always tried to avoid the the big five star hotels, um, but uh, it really is. Um, it, I, I think it's a worthwhile trip. Uh, it, it's just, uh, um, I, I think what Paul gave a pretty good overview of just about everything that, that you can be exposed to. Thank you, James. And it's important. I mean, these, these are our closest neighbors that we know very little about uh, since the 1950s. Um, and uh, we have real great opportunities, especially since the Pope and, and uh, Obama, to make connections and to deepen them uh, with, the, uh, with the people of the of the island, and uh, we take advantage of that opportunity to see birds and make a difference. Other questions? So is, can you buy a humbug for your backyard? Yes. Um, I. I don't know. I, you can buy a humbug. It's, it's 
think the folks at just Google Humbug. <laughs> I've and never heard of it. That's kind of cool. It really works. I mean, you 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 create uh, a you're rotting um, banana. You throw it in there, or or, or some rotting fruit, and the, the flies find it because there's openings for the flies to come in and infest the place. And then uh, they start you know moving around and and uh, collecting, and it works. And so it isn't just that you're you're providing uh, sugar water for the hummingbirds. Uh, you're mighty, uh, providing some more meaty, if I may use that, uh, uh, cuisine uh, for the hum uh, for the hummers and little fruit flies and stuff. It's really cool. And and our friend, um, they're actually you know, used it has has been using it for years and and enjoys it. It's an added feature to it. It's really kind of cool. Any other questions? So is there a university aspect of ornithology or it's... Yes. Um, there are you, there, uh, you saw the picture of our two lady friends, Alieni and Lourdes. Uh, they teach um, ornithology. He did more of this is some wonderful research on the association of rice growing in Cuba and bird population, and the fact that um, the balance of rice rice fields created natural habitat for long-legged waders and 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 cranes and sandhill cranes along the way, some terns and rails and other birds uh, that, that were sustained at the same time. Um, uh, the, he was doing research on that. And also they did a lot, they're doing a lot of interaction at the uh, uh, elementary, so-called middle school and high school level on, on the native birds of Cuba. As a matter of fact, what was really very interesting during some of the difficult situations during both COVID and before that, especially during COVID, um, they were unable to, to, to leave very far out of town. So they found new things to bring students to at the botanical gardens nearby uh, in, a, in a safe situation. It was really terrific for the kids. And they used some of our, you know, some of the coloring books and other educational materials that we uh, provided for them. So it's really terrific. And, and uh, also, as I showed you the picture of the uh, of the museum uh, in Holguin, um, they do lots of education, engaged in that with lots of kids, um, high school in particular. And it's oh, really oh. very effective. Paul, uh, are, are flights still restricted to Havana? Yeah, the good times, the best times, thank you for asking, Jane. The best times were during the, the Obama and the, the Pope times, when there was openings, when there were uh, flights going to six cities in, in Cuba. Now it only, I think they only go to Havana. They may go, come from different cities, uh, Orlando, Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale, and Tampa, and I believe they all go to, uh, to Havana. So that is by default, it's it's the center of our activity, either the beginning or the end or both. Uh, when we arrive, we leave Havana as soon as possible to go uh, to the Vinales area, which is only about three hours drive away. But when we come back, we spend a day, two or three, uh, in Havana, getting both the cultural, the educational, and the biological uh, aspects down to uh, uh, for our people. It's really a very interesting uh, situation. Any other questions? I know I went through this like like Sherman through Atlanta uh, <laughs> quickly, but it was a lot to cover. Yeah. So we heard about so much poverty and protests in recent last year. Yes. And, and that was the byproduct of the decline of tourism, the byproduct of the shutdown during 
Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what happened during the good times was that all kinds of middle class, in fact, the middle class Cubans were created. They had their Airbnbs, they had their, their uh, home restaurants, and then COVID came. And by the way, and there was lots of trickle down. And the more trickle down there was, there were lots of people selling trinkets and, and souvenirs and some neat stuff. But when COVID hit, everything was shut down, or 90% of it was shut down. Uh, and uh, things were really tough. And so mostly it was the sector in terms of protest. It was the sector that was that had uh, that were among the trickle down beneficiaries of uh, the open relationship, not only to the United States but to, to Europe and and, uh, and and Canada also. There were lots of those those that tourism you know basically shut down, um, and it's just starting to creep up again. Um, and uh, it's 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 a difficult situation, and there and there's a uh, uh, there's a, a situation, difficult situation, with the uh, amount of food that's available. Uh, during COVID, before COVID, during the good times, we hardly saw any lines for, by the way, food is still rational, and as everybody gets staples, some staples. But uh, the last trip, uh, during uh, the last two trips, uh, the lines were full because there was less food coming in from abroad, and there was more... Uh, Difficulty in distributing, uh, having a just distribution of what was available, and and people chafe at that. It's understandable. How about sugarcane? Is that a major crop anymore? No, as a matter of fact, I mean it. It, it is a scandalous. <laughs> as a matter of fact, giving giving out the the hummingbird feeders, we, we learned uh, <laughs> years ago was fine, but now people have a ration supply of sugar for the month. And so uh, to, to have it for your, your spouse and maybe your older kids for, for their coffee and what have you, uh, that's fine. But do you have enough to distribute to the birds? It's sometimes tough. And uh, sometimes we have to bring our own sugar <laughs> to, to facilitate the use of, of, uh, of uh, uh, sugar uh, eaters. And the government has decided that uh, the tourist trade the tourist industry is more important. Bringing in hard dollars has been more important to sustain the society. Well, that's great when things are good. But when things start to fall apart, like during the COVID situation, uh, it's not pretty, necessarily pretty. Things are getting, I've, I've been told in the, last, in the last six, eight months, things have been getting better. But, you know, also, um, they're importing things like, you know, uh, sugar and goodness goes, goodness gracious, even coffee from, from Southeast Asia, from Vietnam. Uh, and that's it, and it gets to be more expensive because of the uh, fuel costs all over. Now, simultaneously, there are rice, rice farmers in the United States, in Louisiana, and in Arkansas, who are chafing to, to sell their, their rice uh, one day's boat trip away to Cuba. And it's very difficult because the Cubans have to still pay cash cash first. And it's uh, it's complicated. But you know, this is essential stuff that we perceive going on while we're engaging our, our counterparts. And, and what and, about coffee? Is there coffee up in the mountains? Uh, there is coffee. But similarly, there's less coffee being produced than there was two or three decades ago. And indeed, uh, as one of my uh, colleagues uh, ascertained and, and let me know, there's not only is there's coffee coming from Vietnam and sugar coming from Vietnam. There's uh, not shade grown coffee, but uh, sun coffee, and the sun coffee is being grown in Vietnam because of uh, the the U.S. helped clear uh, inadvertently helped clear landscape with uh, Agent Orange, and now then they grow sun coffee in those areas. Well, yes, you can close your mouth. Have a but <laughs> it's all interesting stuff. It's all interesting stuff. And by the way, the Cubans, the Cuban people are willing to talk about this all the time. And they're so friendly for in terms of uh, us. Uh, and it's it's uh, that's that's heartening in any case. 
Uh, what, one point I'd like to make, uh, yes. Paul is certainly right about the difficult situation in Cuba, but for visitors coming with hard currency, you will not starve. <laughs> when we went there, you get you get your three meals a day, and uh, you know you get a choice of you know chicken, beef, pork, uh, Playa Larga that had lobster. Uh, so you know for visitors, uh, visitors are much appreciated because of the hard currency they bring. But certainly, uh, I, I, for the visitors themselves, I, I don't I think the hardships are minimal. I will add to that, that, that folks in the city, especially in Havana, are a tougher time than folks in the countryside. They learned with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the special period that, that uh, was after that, that they needed to grow more. And around uh, Havana, but particularly in the outskirts, they, they are uh, agriculturally self-sufficient. And, and, you know, we get... When we go there, we get plenty of good food, and we do it in the city. By the way, a lot of the chicken you get in Cuba is from Purdue. Duh. And go figure. You can you can open your mouth, too, Deborah. And, and a lot of the chicken is <laughs> is special deals uh, with Ar in terms of Arkansas. But we're having successes with our, our counterparts. Wonderful understanding. Uh, wonderful education. People who appreciate us, people who are learning about birds and nature, people who are, uh, and and at the edges of government, um, you know, acting on the, the the cage bird trade in Havana. One of our one of our closest colleagues is uh, Rosendo Martinez, who used to be the the go to guy in, in terms of visitor uh, visitor connections in the in the uh, park system. Now he trains ecotourist guides. I mean, he's got a whole culture of, 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 of people who learn more about birds, and plants, and insects, and palomitas, and those kinds of things, because our folks want to learn more, and they come there. And there are lots of others, too, from Canada and Great Britain who are bird and ecotourist-oriented who want to learn more and engage. It's uh, a fascinating uh, interaction. Somebody asked what paperwork is required to go. Ah, very important. You can't, during, uh, during the Obama time, you could go by yourself. You can't anymore. You have to go with an organization that has, that is qualified to take you. And those three that I showed you uh, have, have uh, licenses to bring people to Cuba uh, for people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, or, uh, and those organizations have the authority to, to bring you over. And uh, you, I'm talking about U.S. citizens. Canadians can go whenever they want. Europeans can go whenever they want. But uh, in terms of the, uh, an American citizen going there, you have to, uh, in theory, and then basically in practice, um, you have to go with an organization that has a licensing permit uh, to bring you there. And indeed, you're supposed to keep track of stuff you're doing. Well, we, we keep track, and our individuals keep track. We have photos of all the distribution of our people-to-people -people engagements, and our itinerary uh, uh, indicates that. So, And as James in also uh, made clear, we're basically not allowed to go to any of the government hotels, particularly those owned by the Ministry of Defense, uh, which are a number of them. And so we go to uh, individual homes, and uh, you know there'll there'll be individual homes next to each other, you know, just out the door and up the street from each other. And so it's uh, and and that's a wonderful experience to interact with our with our hosts. Great stuff. What kind of dollars do you bring? Always uh, there's always uh, changes. I mean, it used to be that you bought tourist dollars. It's very strange. Now. Pounds are good, dollars are good, uh, Canadian dollars are good. It, things are changing. Um, and there used to be two different currencies, the tourist currency and the national citizens currency. Well, now it's kind of mixed up and all together. And it will probably change the next time we go. Um, the advice is to bring, as James could, you know, uh, I don't spend any money. I go there, you know, we include everything, all, you know, everything, meals, everything except uh, tips and booze. 
You know, everything's everything is uh, basically included. Isn't that right, James? Definitely. Uh, and of course, if you go with the Friendship Association, they'll give you uh, suggestions of things that are appreciated and they can bring uh, yes. things uh, such as uh, Yave coffee. Uh, they love the, the Yave espresso coffee. Uh, we, I, I happen to bring um, along with me a lighter, which came in very handy because Cuban matches are really pathetic. <laughs> you know, you use them once and they break. Uh, so I, I had happened to bring one of these lighter type, long lighters, and it, it was very, it was very much appreciated. In fact, we left it behind with the, with the our host in, in Havana. Yeah, we, uh, as I showed you before, we, we bring these pins and give uh, our participants two or three of these pins to give out to the, the local staff or, or people that, that we get to meet and and want to want to engage further in the U.S. Cuban. Uh, Friendship Association uh, relations, and it all adds up, and it's all very good. Okay, well, that was really very interesting. A lot of questions, and uh, I guess we'll yeah. If if the uh, group Deborah or or Kathy at the company, I mean, uh, and Susan, you know, if if you have three or four people who want to go, contact us. Uh, we'll add another three, four, five, six. And we'll piece it together. Uh, so will the other groups that I've, I've mentioned. Um, it, it, it can be very exciting and very educational. And we make a difference. We do. Little differences add up. And, and I'd, I'd like to put a plug in for the Friendship Association. Um, uh, Solda Paluka has been doing these tours for, what, two decades now? Yeah. So she has the contacts. She has the know-how. Of how to go get in and out of Cuba, um, I, I totally uh, well organized. Um, she gets the 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 best staff to, for the bus driver is key. She always manages to find a first rate bus driver that who's turns out to be more than a driver. He's also a fixer and helps uh, helps get us get through the difficult situations. Yeah, sometimes you know after COVID, a lot of the um private restaurants closed down. I mean, this last time we, our bus driver helped us find the, the private restaurants on the road. It was amazing. And they were all terrific and quick and, and tasty. It was, uh, it was really great. Uh, so that was, it. Uh, that was a really, uh, so me. that was really very good. Hope that answers our questions. Yes. Thank you so much again, Paul. And if you have any more questions or are really interested in going, pass around my email. Uh, I'll answer and we'll piece something together or we'll refer you to some other operation that's, uh, that's going there soon. Like I said, from this fall through the winter into uh, March of next year, we'll hopefully go once or twice uh, with a group of around a dozen folks, maybe a little more than a dozen. And by the way, the, the bus you saw fits, as uh, James can tell you, if it's 23 people and we put in 15, so there's plenty of room. There's no, there's no operation shoehorn going on here. Mm -hmm. Stuffing people are on, uh, in a comfortable, uncomfortable situation. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks again, Paul. We'll say Thank good you. night. Have Thank you for organizing us. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night, everybody. Yes. Bye. Bye.